Welcome to the Recovery Stories podcast, bringing you stories of hope, healing, and triumph over the bondage of addictions, mental health struggles, trauma, and dysfunctional family systems. Our courageous storytellers have chosen to live their journey out loud in order to show others that they don't have to suffer in silence. The stories you will hear are raw, real, and may involve graphic and triggering content. This podcast is brought to you by Promises Behavioral Health's Rooted Alumni Community. If you or a loved one are struggling, have questions, or are ready to take the next step, call our admission center at 888-648-4098. Or visit us online at www.promisesbehavioralhealth.com. Our team is ready and waiting to answer the call for help. Welcome to this episode of Rooted Recovery Stories. My name is Patrick Custer and I'm your host. I am absolutely so excited to be here today with our special guest. She's an American fashion designer and television personality. She founded the women's streetwear line Married to the Mob in 2004 and has starred on the reality television series The Real Housewives of New York City. Among my favorite of her qualities, though, is that she is out loud and proud about her sobriety. Welcome to the beautifully chaotic Leah McSweeney. Thank you. That was a great intro. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, you know, wording is everything. And um, I just, you know, okay, so your book came out in recent history. And it is uh, wonderful. I really, really, really enjoyed it. And I wanted to ask you if we could just start off by you explaining to our audience why you chose to talk about chaos theory being the theme to, you know, kind of look through the lens of your life. You know, I think because it is like it, because it is kind of the way that I look at my life because, you know, the whole idea behind chaos theory is that, you know, through the chaos, there is some kind of order. And if I didn't look at things that way, I would literally just cry all the time. So, you know, even when like, and I know it's very cliche, it's not like, you know, I'm, I'm came up with some new idea or anything, but I really do live in the, like, the way of being like, you know, everything happens for a reason. Of course, I believe in like, free will and like, you know, obviously all of that, but I have to find like the lesson in everything because like life is fucked up, you know, and like it's hard and fucked up shit happens. And if there isn't a lesson in these things, then what's the point? Absolutely. We always, we, or we're always at that fork in the road where we can either learn from the tragedy, the get the gifts of the present time, the gifts of our circumstance. And that's one of the things that I love so much. It's a constant theme. Even though you named it that, you actually you actually totally live that throughout the book and how you how you um so I couldn't encourage um our audience more. Really, really, really go out and get Leah's book. It is so wonderful. Thank you. Um yeah, absolutely. So next, I want to ask you, you just came off the, the end of uh, BravoCon. Are mm-hmm. there any highlights you want to share with us? Was, it, was this your first BravoCon to go to? Yeah. So there was the first one, which was in 2019. And that was like when I was actually filming Roni, like my first season. Uh, okay. So they kind of like announced me there and I was there for like a little bit, but like no one knew who I was. Obviously, I hadn't been on TV yet. So this was a gotcha. different experience, obviously. And there were so many highlights. I mean, look, you know, it the fans are just so like so happy to see you and be a part of it. And like some people came up to me and they were like, I'm sober too, or like, thanks for talking about mental health, like on TV, you know, and like that's obviously like, always really special, like when someone says that. And then, you know, seeing some of the people from the other, you know, shows on the network, that's always fun too. So yeah, it was a great experience. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so awesome. You know, I I have to say, so when <clears throat> I had taken a little break, my husband is a huge Housewives fan and um, I had taken a little break from watching New York. And when you came on, he was so excited and told me all about, and he was like, they're, they're doing something awesome. They're bringing this, you gotta, you know, check it out. And 
anyway, I, I, you know, it's been really interesting to watch that um, journey. You know, at least what what they've shown to us on television of your story. But outside of that, how you've you've gotten vulnerable and open and and media venues just just across the board from your book to interviews all over the place. And I love that radical honesty, not only outwardly, but with yourself where it starts. Thank you. And so, yeah, I, I, I think that having voices like yours, Bronwyn, I love Bronwyn. We've had her on the show, just pe- strong individuals that are just, you know, unapologetically loud about their experience And the ebbs and flows, which we're going to get into, of how everything's not freaking perfect just because you decide to walk through the door of a solution-based life. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Not at all. (laughs) So, yeah. So so let's, let's start back at the beginning. I'd love to... I always ask our guests to assume that, you know... A grand majority of our audience may have never, you know, heard part of your story or any of your story before. So, you know, for those of uh, those who don't know, where where were you raised, and what did your family life look like at the very beginning? So, I was born and raised in Manhattan on Twenty Fourth Street and Eighth Avenue in Chelsea. I grew up in a building complex called Penn South, and my grandmother was one of the first tenants there. They actually built these buildings for the garment workers, but you know, obviously wow. like non-garment workers like lived there too. And my grandmother was one of the first tenants. You know, these are like this is kind of like lottery-based apartments, so they're okay. super they're co-ops. So they're like very like I think our apartment was like you know, $700 a month or something like that. Like, it's like, you know, wow. people wait on this lottery to get these apartments for like 30 years, you know, my upbringing was like, you know, my, my mom was a social worker or is a social worker slash therapist. And my dad at the time was a projectionist at Angelica movie theater. So like super like, you know, like working class, you know, middle-class family, and, you know, it's interesting because like, I, I had a great, I had a great childhood. I loved growing up in the city. Mm-hmm. Like I loved our neighborhood. Like I had a lot of friends. Like I was an outgoing child. Like, you know, I had my brother and sister who were born. My sister was born six years uh, when I was six years old. And then my brother was born when I was nine. And I was like, really loved being a sister, big sister. You know, I mean, and I kind of always like tie this because since this is a podcast about recovery and everything, like Mm -hmm. I thought about like how my upbringing maybe like contributed to my like addiction issues or whatever. And like, I can't, you know, it's like, obviously like we learn like in when we're working in a solution based, you know, kind of lifestyle, you know, that this is not you know, we can't blame this or pin this on anything. Like maybe, you know, it's like nature and nurture. And it's always like very interesting to me, like why. And, you know, I mean, just to be totally transparent, I don't think, and I know that my, my sister and brother wouldn't mind, but like they, you know, my, they're both sober. And, you know, this is something that me, my sister and brother all have across the gene pool. Like it didn't, anyone. you know, my mother's been sober for like, 42 years, I think she's got sober two years before I was born. And my father likes his alcohol. Okay. I'm not gonna, you know, he's like, you know, it's not like I grew up with him drinking, but now that he's retired, he definitely like, likes to party. Mm -hmm. So, you know, alcoholism was it, I didn't grow up around it because like I said, my mom was sober. My dad didn't really drink a lot when I was younger, but it was in our DNA. Like it's literally is in our DNA, you know? So I'm sorry if I'm going off, like, and I'm digressing. You just No, this is exactly what I, yeah. where I wanted to go with. And, and my next question on that topic is, you know, cause you touched on two things, the, you know, what it, what it, the, the gen- genetic component of who, what, when, where, but 
what was the narrative of mental health slash uh, substance use disorder um, addiction in your family? Uh, clearly, your mom was sober. So was it talked about? Was it was it demonized? You know, how, how did you talk about those things that's or such, didn't you? That's actually such a good question. So I remember being young and my, all my cousins, I have a huge family. My mom has eight siblings. And so they all have kids. And so we would always go to my grandmother's house in New Jersey, like on weekends and in the summer. And all my cousins were allowed to take sips of wine. My mother would not let me ever take a sip of wine or beer or anything. She was terrified of me becoming an alcoholic. <laughs> And obviously, even if I had had the sips of wine, it wouldn't have changed anything. You know, I really don't think it's like you're either an addict or you're not, you know, like right. it's it's kind of that's the way it is. Even though obviously there's all these stories about people as like in their late adulthood that get injured and start taking, you know, oxys and stuff. And then they physically become addicted, you know, which is a different. Mm -hmm. I think it's different. That's a bit different. Yeah. But <clears throat> so there was never, my mom took me to like meetings when, with her when I was very young. So I was kind of exposed to it, but I didn't really, you know, the thing is also this, I started drinking and getting fucked up at like age 12, 13. So there wasn't like that much time to really talk to me about this. Like I was already in rehab, mm -hmm. I was already doing meth at age 14 and in rehab at 15. So there was not like, I didn't have a, like my parents didn't sit me down when I was 10 and say like, we have a genetic like disorder basically. And like, you might be right. exposed to it. It was too late. And even as like a young person, like I was actually talking about this the other day when I made my first communion, I was chugging the wine. The priest had to rip the, the wine cup out of my hand. So what the hell? I was like six or seven years old, you know, like I was just, I was on a war path, like from a very young age, like, it's right. just, it's in my DNA. So obviously when I finally went to rehab or like not finally, but when I went to rehab at 15, a lot of stuff came out during like the family mm. weekends that I didn't know about, like mental health stuff on like some, mm -hmm. my dad's side and like, you know, just different like depression issues. But, but for the most part, it's not like it was that talked about openly. Like I, I hate mm -hmm. that because like, my mom probably would remember differently, but it's definitely not like my daughter. Like right now we're watching Euphoria together. Don't judge me. And, like, uh, maybe the worst parent. Oh, no. no. But like, you know, I mean, it's like the hardcore sex stuff is a little much in front of her. I'm like, cover your eyes, you know. But last night I watched the episode where she's really, I mean, obviously Rue is fighting with her mom all the time, but it's one of the times where she's really like the mom hides all the drugs and she's kicking the doors and she's punching her. She's fighting with her sister. And I just started crying. Cause I'm like, damn, that is hits so close to home. And like, I remember that destruction and that, that like, that grip that it had on me and like the destruction that it wreaked, that the havoc it wreaked on my family, like as a teenager and I had a younger brother and sister, you know, mm -hmm. so it was really so, bad. <laughs> it's interesting to me how you describe, you know, family life at a young age being so what seemingly normal and, you know, addiction does what addiction does. It doesn't care, you know, our, it's, it's no respecter of socioeconomic status or where we came from or what have you. We definitely know that environmental influences can, you know, whatever, but I'm, I'm curious, uh, how I always like to know what was your level of insight, right? Like what was in Leah's brain as you are going through, first of all, let's talk about, school you went to catholic school right in new york city private, so, private is a girl school yeah so this is the other thing that i used to kind of be like i felt other than like you know you always hear like yeah. alcoholics say that like i didn't feel like i was a part of you know and i did my parents it wasn't we had like partial financial aid for me to go to a very very wealthy type of upper east side all girl school like gossip girl type shit you know listen, I, no one was mean to me. I had friends, all that. It was more like I internalized our, you know, 
the disparate, like how much less we had, like in terms of like material and our apartment and, you know, everything, like it gave me a chip on my shoulder. And I felt like Mm -hmm. I was jealous, first of all, of my friends, because they were like Mm -hmm. living in sick apartments with like tons of like anything they wanted, you know? And I just felt like, I had to make up for that in some way. And I think I was, Mm -hmm. I'm going to be the clown. I'm going to be the bad girl. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be the partier, you know, like I feel like I kind of had, and then the other thing I didn't mention, which is really when the shit hit the fan is we, my parents moved me and my sister and brother to Connecticut when I was 14 after I got thrown out of Sacred Heart, uh, the Upper East Side private school, I got thrown out and my parents were like, we need to get a better life for you. And they're like, we're going to move you. We got to move to Connecticut. But what they didn't understand is that those kids are doing so many drugs too. And also I just was running away right. from home and coming back to the city. And like, I felt other than there also, because like, I'm like, no offense, but I was like calling them hicks and stuff, which isn't nice. And they're not. But at the time at 14, I'm not, they don't like, they're not reading Vogue. They don't understand. Like they're not going to clubs in the city. Like I was like, I'm more sophisticated. And you know, I could have joined sport. I was really good at sports when I was younger. I was acting when I was younger. I could have joined the drama club. Like I didn't do any of that shit. I was like, where are the people doing drugs? Let's go. So do you remember your first exposure to drugs? Like what that experience was like for you and like what went through your head? Oh my God. Of course. I mean, yeah, I remember, well, I remember my first, like, like getting drunk and I got blackout drunk. I was at a friend's house actually in Westchester randomly. And her mom was like sleeping and it was a bunch of girls sleeping over and we stole her vodka. And I just remember like chugging the vodka and it tasting like rubbing alcohol and like chasing it with orange juice. I peed on myself. I threw up. I didn't remember anything. I was crying. I was hysterical. Like typical, like same. That's how I got drunk. Not like peeing on myself and throwing up. But I was like, I got hysterical and emotional every time I drank from that moment on. And I always was a blackout drinker. Like the things that happened on Roni in season 12, I didn't even remember until I watched the episodes. Wow. Like I had no idea. I mean, I knew I threw the tiki torches, you know? Right. I didn't know exactly. I don't remember throwing champagne on a tiki torch. You know, when we were in Rhode Island, I was in a full blackout. I mean, I think a lot of the women were. <laughs> but like, you know, right. I was the one acting crazy. So I didn't realize I was rolling around on the ground and you know like having like an exorcism like I didn't know until I watched it so anyway my first that was my first drunk and that this girl's house and the next day I was like that was awesome and then my first time doing only positive an only positive yeah like like, realization of the whole thing fun like that was so much fun yeah like I don't know just something like I needed to get out of myself I needed to lose Mm -hmm. myself I needed to like I'm, my brain is intense, you know, like, so I needed to like, I needed a break from my brain. I needed an escape from everything. Like I like escaping, you know, I mean, I still, I still do. I just, we have to cope in other ways. Obviously I'm still the same fucked up person though. <laughs> just with better coping. Mechanism. Right. Oh yes. I love that so much because what you, you don't, who wishes and you, a theme again, that you say all the time, you don't, don't live with regret don't wish away your past. Yeah. It's, it's your tool. Right. And part of the biggest part of your life. I I'm curious about w- what there are some similar themes that you talk about that I can relate to in my own life of living in and around much wealthier kids and families than your, you know, what you were raised in. And was that ever a point of contention for you? with how you viewed your parents for like for putting you in a place where you were so other, did you blame them or did you blame, was there a point of, cause at a certain point in addiction, of course, it's always everyone else's fault other than our own, but for, you know, as you're developing as a youngster and you know, all of this is going on the, the pre rebellion and everything. Do you remember having any sort of, of, you know, insight into, into this and a dialogue about. I know it's interesting because it's like, damn, what was going through my, like, what did like 13 year old Leah like think? Like, what were those, you know, I don't think I was thinking that much. Like, I think I was like more like 
trying to just party and hang with my friends. Like, cause you know, Mm -hmm. and I wasn't at that point angry about my parents sending me to Sacred Heart because like I had friends, I liked it. Like, you know, I liked the girls that in the class that I was with, like my best friend, like I had three best friends that were all like, you know, that we hung out all the time and I was friends. It's a very small school, you know? So you, everyone knows everyone. And it's not that clicky because it's hard to be clicky because like, there's literally only like 20 kids in your grade, you know, or whatever. So I don't, I didn't blame, I I really blame the move. Like the move was a major, like at that point I was like, I hate my parents. Like, I hate you guys. You don't understand anything. You're fucking the worst people in the world. Like, and I was going to do, I I was so angry at them. The stuff with Sacred Heart didn't come till later. Like, I was like, how could you send me to that school? And that's probably why I felt like shit about myself. And that's probably why I started getting high. And, you know, I mean, I blame them for everything at, at certain points. Like, I literally, you know, I don't, I don't blame them for anything anymore. But like, there was I, points where even in early sobriety, that was like very like in my early, like in 2009, when I first got sober the, the, the first time the original time, you know, I think that first couple years of sobriety, I was like, I could, I couldn't even go to Christmas with them because I was so angry, so angry at them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think, I think so many of us can for sure. But also, but in terms of like insight, you know, and like what I was thinking, it was a time, it was like 1995 in New York City, 1996. I lived a few blocks away from the limelight and tunnel. And like, I was so into like the club scene and I was so enthralled in like getting into the Roxy. How am I going to go out? Like, you know what I mean? Like I was all about being out, partying, hanging out with my friends. Like the movie Kids came out like a year before that. I was like, that needs to be my life too. Like, you know, I idolized that kind of fucked up, like shit. Like I just like that's what yeah. I wanted, you know. Sadly, Which makes sense. There's and and well, it's you know, it's part of the the truth of your journey and your story. And you look at the '90s and, like you said, especially the '90s in New York City. Like, of course, of course. Well, I was, there was at one point like my mom was like, "You like could have done this and that." I'm like, I got to fucking be at the clubs in New York in the '90s, like nothing else is ever going to like top that or match that or like as yeah. fucked up as it was. And as many people I know that didn't even get out of that and ended up like dying. Cause they moved on to heroin and like, you know, it killed mm-hmm. them. Like, yeah, thank God I got out. It could have turned out a lot differently, but like, you know, those were some of the best nights of my life. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, one of my big role models, who's also, he's sober a million years. I don't even know at this point, RuPaul talks about how, He's like, I wouldn't take back my using years. I don't regret that the choices that I made during that time. I mean, there are things that I did that I regret, but you know, he says, I don't, I don't regret the part of me that experienced that lifestyle. And there's a, there's so much of me that can understand that as well, because, and you talk about that again in your book of just, of the importance of, like every single, the butterfly effect of every single thing along the way affecting your trajectory and journey that you might not even be here today if all of those things hadn't happened the way they did. Yeah. I didn't know RuPaul was sober. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. It is pretty cool. Um, It's one of those things where he, he, he actually doesn't talk about it super frequently. And he's been sober so long that I think it's, it's something that people forget about but yeah yeah so okay big theme for literally all of us in in uh life but especially in recovery even in active addiction is shame right so you talk about getting kicked out of uh, sacred heart at 14 what are you able to talk about the circumstances like what happened why did you get kicked out was it related to addiction yeah no Well, I mean, it was like related to my personality, you know, so possibly (laughs) (laughs) Um, I, I think there was like a Bunsen burner incident, like in science class, but really they, 
didn't my whole class was like kind of wild like my grade mm-hmm. and they just needed a scapegoat i was a scapegoat you know it's a very old like theme too in my life like i've i like always have to defend myself and like i feel like i've been the scapegoat i'm always the scapegoat like in so mm-hmm. many circumstances like even like like on roni like sometimes you know and and yeah absolutely i'm, yeah, I'm the scapegoat <laughs> So how did you, did you internalize that? Like, so that's what I would want to get at is this whole the shame piece. Like, did you, how did that play into the next period of your life yeah, moving no, to Connecticut? That was like, oh, it was horrible. It was one of the, it was really demoralizing, like to be asked to mm-hmm. leave. Also, I was asked to leave mid year, not even at the end of the year. They wanted me to leave like after Christmas break. And my mother was like, absolutely not. Where is she going to go? Like, we're not doing that. I really felt like, damn, like they're just throwing me out like that. I've been here since like third grade, you know, like it felt, yeah, it was bad. I definitely internalized it. I definitely felt a lot of shame around it. I felt like it was like me against the world. And it made me really hate authority even more than I already did. That makes all the sense in the world. I, you know, the, the, you talk about matching the chaos of your emotions with the chaos of your actions, whether the action piece being behavior or using whatever the case may be. The, this path, this this narrative is what leads us into the you know the the double edged sword of chicken or the egg, mental health on top of of addiction, and so. You know, I kind of wondering if you looking back, hindsight being 2020, where did you see, where did, were were you able to see a roller coaster of, aside from the drugs and alcohol, we all self-medicate. I mean, as addicts, like we're self-medicating from the get-go, you know? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But were you able to identify now looking back when mental health issues started to arise for you? You know, it's interesting because I've never even thought about it. Like, cause I've always just been like, I didn't really see that there were mental health issues until I stopped using. Like I had mm. like until 2009, like I had no idea. Like I went through my whole life probably being bipolar too <laughs> and had no idea oh. that you know, but I also wasn't at the time, there was no stopping me from like doing drugs. Like there was no stopping me from going to raves. There was no stopping me from running away. And like, right. Like, is it a combo of like, you know, I have like my own theories about bipolar two disorder. Like a lot of the, right. Cause it's like hypomania, but like not actual mania. You're not like actually like having delusions. Like you understand like reality versus like delusion, but you're hypomanic, like hypersexuality and like, you know, spending a lot of money and like, you know, risky behaviors. Those are all things that addicts do when they're like not treated when, you know, mm-hmm. it's the depression side of it that makes it like a little more real, you know, and I, have experienced like really bad depressions, like after having these kind of like up hypomanic kind of things. So I, I do know that I have bipolar two disorder, but um, it's hard in hindsight. Like I have no idea when it started. Like, I mean, I was always very impulsive, you know, I was mm-hmm. always, but like the depression stuff, it's like hard to know because I was medicating myself and it probably, honestly, the drugs and alcohol probably saved me in a lot of ways for a lot of oh, weeks. absolutely! Right? Like, yeah, because it works. Like you know, yeah. you talk about how the like this is the the we get the positive effect, and you know the how much we use and the consequences and everything, and it like it tends to as as the time goes on, you know, it goes in that opposite direction. So, how did consequences catch up with you as your teen years were progressing? You know, just those mile markers. What was it? that um you would say was your first oh shit moment that things weren't 
like your things weren't like they should be. Maybe they were they were like the friends that you were choosing to spend time with, but they weren't I, necessarily like life. Yeah, I think my first like oh fuck moment really was when I had to when I woke up one morning, my bags were packed and my parents were like being really weird. I'm like, why is my suitcase on the dining table? Why didn't I wake, get wake, woken up for school? Is grandma dead? What's happening? And they're like, we found a place for you to go. They're going to help you. This was the first week of 10th grade, first week of sophomore year. I had disappeared for like five days at the end of August. School starts really early in Connecticut. Like August 27th is like the first day of school. I know that because it's my birthday and it would always be my fucking birthday, which sucked. So like <laughs> five days before August 27th, I was just on like a bender of like doing crystal meth and like ecstasy and like at people's apartments and at raves and right. in the city and just totally disappeared. Came home. My parents were like not really talking to me. And I woke up a week late, you know, a week later I woke up. And they were like, you're going to the Karen Foundation. And I thought that, I was like, no, I'm not going anywhere for a month. You're crazy. They're like, just come and check it out. And then we'll decide. And I was like, okay, fine. You know, I have no choice. So then they're like, why don't you just stay for a night and see how you like it? And I was like, fine. But do you promise you're going to come get me tomorrow? And they're like, we promise. And then my father, I'm like, can you please get me a pack of cigarettes? I'm out. He came back with a course. I smoked Newports back then. So he came back with a carton of Newports, not a pack. And I was like, why did you get me a carton? And he's like, they only had cartons. And I was like, oh, okay. I should have known then. I'm here for 30 days. 30 packs of cigarettes, you know? So that was my first. That was my first. Because the other the other thing is like going disappearing and doing acid and going to raves. Like that was fun. Like I didn't I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. Like I was like, this is the where it's at. Like I don't give a fuck, you know? Yeah. I was like totally in another world. The addict in me goes, gosh, what a great dad thinking ahead for her. Like yeah, she's going to need cigarettes really all 30 of these days. <laughs> it was nice. It really was. Yeah. So you know what how would you describe that experience like did you did you get to a place of radical acceptance you know what it was first of all it's a great place it's a great rehab i mean that was a long time ago but i think it's still probably sure. in the place absolutely i first of all i cried i cried so much. I cried for seven days straight. I didn't talk to anyone. I refused to take part of the groups. Like I, I wouldn't call myself an alcoholic in our groups. Like everyone else was like, I'm so and so an alcoholic. I was like, I'm Leah. I'm just here like visiting, you know, I was crying so much. Like, I don't think I cried this much ever in my life. And they explained, I actually understood at the age of 15, I just had turned 15. I understood that I had something different than everyone else. Like I had this, I had addiction. I had alcoholism because when they explained, mm -hmm. they said like some people have a red light in their brain. It tells them to stop when they're like getting drinking. And like you guys have green lights that just say, give me more, more, more. And when they said that, I was like, Oh my God, that's so true. Like, because like it was always, I was always one of the ones who was drinking the most and doing the most drugs and like wanting the party to keep going for days and everyone else would be like, I'm going to sleep, you know? So I understood, I was like, damn. And I also understood in that moment during that time there, I was like, wow, like I'm never going to be able to like drink normally or do drugs recreationally. And I, and if I continue to do drugs and drink, it's going to take me off the path that, and I always was like believed in God, like as a child and teenager and whatever. Like, so I always believed that like God like has plans for us. And like, he had a plan for me. And I knew that if I did drugs and I drank, I wouldn't be able to follow that natural flow, that natural plan. Cause I'd be taking, taking it off and taking it in my own will because God's like will for me is for me, not for me to do drugs and alcohol. You know what I mean? Right. But when I'm, right. I can't, I can't like connect, you know, like I can't connect and I can't like, I can't access the gifts. Mm -hmm. 
that God has for me, you know? And when I say God, I don't like, you know, it can be universe, whatever, like energy, like just that flow, like whatever it is, like, I don't know what it is, you know, but I understood that. So when I got out of that rehab, I stayed sober for like maybe four or five months after that, I was going to AA meetings in my town, like, you know, all that. But then I started dating a way older guy who was a crystal meth addict. So that was that, but you know, was he also in the program? No, he wasn't. No. Oh. <laughs> no, I just met him like randomly, of course. I always can find the winners. Yeah. It was like I knew, like ever since I'm 15, like I knew all the years I continued to do drugs or drink or whatever. Like I knew like this is not what I should be doing. I have a problem. Mhm. Mhm. Yeah. But, you know, I and I one of the things that I'd like to point out here is that uh, I heard recently, and I just love this so much, somebody saying, you know, we're constantly evolving in the behavioral health community and as society, how we how we learn and talk to and about each other in mental health and um, substance use disorder. And, you know, whether or not people use the word relapse, I like, I'm, tr- I'm trying to train myself to use the word recurrence of symptoms instead because even even substance use disorder like i've never heard that like i'm like addiction like what is that you know what i mean substance use disorder that's interesting yeah yeah um and so you know the the america because i work in behavioral health i get apprised of all of the new terms that we're supposed to you know that are the the medically uh, or clinically appropriate approved terms to use and so we get we get we get it a little bit earlier before they become popular among like regular folks but but i i think that something i just my my heart my as a person in recovery that just jived so strongly with me when i heard this the other day was t- to look at through a lens of the recovering person rather than putting you know we can say all day long that I, you know people who get up in in recovery meetings and they get their 25 year chip and say you know but by the grace of god i only have i'm only one day sober at a time yada yada uh you know and they talk about how they did it and it is amazing when somebody's got so many years of sobriety. But I think as human nature goes, we tend to put these people up on a pedestal regardless and put up on a pedestal the collection of years that people people gather Mm -hmm. as being better or higher quality recovery. And it is a discouraging It's a discouraging process, I think, for the other people who have a journey, some similar to yours, that involved multiple recurrences of the symptoms of of substance use disorder Um, or mental health. I like that. That sounds good. Yeah. And so as you go along the way, life happens. You're dealing with stuff outside of your control, chaos wanting to fit in, not wanting to fit in. (laughs) Right. Another thing. All right. You even, you even talk about this. I've heard you talk about it in interviews before and other things, you know, like the, the, the whole thing with chaos with you is it's like, I want to fit in. And at the same time, I don't want to fit in. And that is in a nutshell, what my decision-making process and rebellion has kind of looked like inside and outside, you know, just like that, that's the the fire the the fiery leah and i don't know i am curious about how you would describe this next phase as you go through and you know you're you already that light has been turned on the switch has been flipped the knowledge you know right you are at karen you're there and you know but you're like i i'm in this place of life where this is what I'm going to do. And this is what I, I, did you feel like this is what you have to do? Oh yeah. There were definitely time. I felt like I had no control over it. Like I felt like I don't want to, like there were times where I felt like I did want to be doing drugs and drinking, but there were times where I didn't want to, and I couldn't stop. Right. Like I was a prisoner, you know, like that's Mm -hmm. how it, that's how it. So 
you had hopes and aspirations from a young age that you talk about and fashion being at the forefront of that. And, you know, you through it all continued to cling to it. What did that look like in these teen years, post-treatment, post your first treatment? What was, what was your, um, what did your life look like as far as chasing that down in the midst of juggling that double-edged sword? Right. Like having a dream and like wanting like, a mm -hmm. dream while also being like a drug addict, you know, it's hard to manage both. I just kept like, I kept praying. I kept pushing forward. Like, even though like I was really like non-functional in some ways, you know, I also like when I, like, for instance, when I started my brand, right, I was 22 or something. I think I was 22. I don't even know like how I got it to be successful. I honestly think that I took all the fucking crazy energy that I had inside of me that like, because I would literally be able to get drugs wherever I went. You know what I mean? Like I would, sure. yeah, like I would do anything to get them. I always could find them. If I had to walk barefoot in a blizzard, I would go get them. Like, you know, I put all of that crazy shit I had inside of me into the brand. And then like, I think that's how it became successful. So it's almost like the part of my personality that made me like an amazing, a good drug addict, you know, like also helped me to get the brand off the ground. If that makes any sense. Absolutely. And it's, it's one of those things that both you hear this common thread of many people who are addicts in recovery, but also people who struggle with bipolar disorder. Right. geniuses geniuses that you know through the chaos you know people on the outside don't get it don't under, you know don't understand the person on the inside is constantly feeling misunderstood you were like screw it all i'm going to do i'm going to chase it i'm going <laughs> to yeah i mean and i'm definitely not I'm definitely not a genius um at all but I think that, and I just read an article about agitated depression and like how like a lot mm -hmm. of entrepreneurs that have like bipolar two disorder. And it's crazy because I do get agitated a lot. That's when I know like, I'm like, oh, I need to like, you know, take more, better care of myself because I feel very irritated and agitated and, you mm -hmm. know, my stress levels are a lot, but there's definitely some, there is there's definitely personality traits and characteristics that are tied into bipolar two disorder and a sub substance use disorder that mm -hmm. are very, uh, that are also tied into entrepreneurship. Yes, absolutely. Creativity, you know? So yeah, you talked about the people in your school being raised around people in your school that had not only economic, means that were different or outside of yours, but relational or access to like skills that were, I'm trying to remember how you worded that, but this, it's, oh, hold yeah. on one second. I have a note. Yeah. I know. Do you remember what I'm talking about? Talking about because like they like were very, like they knew how to, <sighs> sit properly at a dine at a dinner table. They yes. knew, you know, yes, they knew how to move in a different way than I knew how to, how to move through the world and different social circles. Mm -hmm. And I did learn that. I mean, I learned that from going to Sacred Heart for sure, because it exposes you to new, a, a life that I was not familiar with. Right. That that's what exactly what it was. I was looking for that verbiage, the material and experiential wealth beyond your world. And, and, Gosh, that experiential wealth, I think when I referenced, you know, the, the, the genius behind bipolar addiction, you, you know, you name it. I think what I was getting at more than anything is the ability to see through relationships, experiences, add them together and figure out how you're going to piece together a successful path for yourself. And you didn't give up, which I think is pretty cool. 
Thank you. No matter what. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you're going forward, you meet Rob, you, you know, what, what age was that that you met Rob? 20. Okay. And you're starting your brand. And what was the, what was the next hitch for you where things slowed down and you had to take a second look at considering sobriety? So I had a pretty steady run from like that age to like 27. I just didn't even think twice about, you know, I had stopped doing the hard drugs like, cause I wasn't going to raves anymore. I'm not going to continue to smoke angel dust. You know what I mean? Like I was like, okay, I can't do that. You know, but like, you know, I was drinking a lot and like taking whatever pills I could find, you know, that was like more socially acceptable, I guess, cocaine and things like, you know what I mean? Like it wasn't like, yeah, like a na- nasty meth or something, you know, when I, after I had my daughter and I had her when I was, I think I was 25. I think I was 25 and I, was I 26 then when I stopped? I Maybe I was 27. I, I can't really remember. But I think it was... So I had her in 2007. And right. Yeah. Hey, it, well, I have a question on that. Did you... When you had her, you talk about it was like it felt so easy. Like there was just no question that you were not going to use or drink during that period. And, you know, I, I'm curious because I... What was the, was there a narrative that went through your head about your addiction at that point? If I can stop for this, am I really, am I really an addict? Did you, did you have that discussion with yourself? Like maybe, I think like I was so focused on like, because I was the happiest pregnant person like ever, like whatever the hormones, like I need the doctors to give me whatever hormones pregnant women have. Like I need them all. I don't even have to take antidepressants if I could get those hormones. Because the hormones were so good for me. I wasn't depressed. I didn't miss drinking. Like, I didn't, I was just, it wasn't even like a thing. Like, I just became totally engulfed in like having this baby. And I was preparing so much for her, like, and reading every single book. And, you know, I had moved into this like big loft and I was like building the nursery. And, you know, I was really like just nesting and busy with the brand. My company was doing really well. And I was just, it was, I was really happy. Like me and Rob were getting mm. along, you know, probably cause I wasn't drinking. <laughs> and then once I had her, oh, yeah, things were not as, you know, as, as glorious actually, because, you know, I was dealing with postpartum. I yeah. was dealing with the stress of having a newborn, me and Rob mm. now fighting again. And pretty quickly, I was like, I need to drink. Like I miss drinking. And did you know that you were having postpartum or was it, I'm just not happy. And I I didn't know until later. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Like I was just like crying all the time and like worrying about my daughter dying. Like, and I would like read like an article about like a child being hurt or something. And I'd be like, like, it was just like, I was a disaster. Yeah. And then I had when I, I, me and Rob broke up when she was like a year old or something. And then, and then like he had her half the time. So I just fucking like my life just fell apart. Like my life fell apart. Sure. But it just fell apart so quickly. And I think having a child just put like a giant microscope over like it just like, made it her it made it go so much faster it fast forwarded everything because like I just it was just so much more dark like I'm like my daughter's in a crib I'm throwing up in the toilet being so hungover this is not the kind of mother I wanted to be this is not what I imagined for myself but then I had like a white light experience that like you know they talk about sometimes I had this moment of a death premonition basically that I wasn't making it to my next birthday and that's when I I didn't take another drink for 10 years. Wow. Did you go, uh, did you participate in any recovery fellowships yeah. um, to support that? I did. Mm-hmm. For the, yeah, it did, yeah. I did not, didn't last 
forever, but for the first few years I did. And then like, I started smoking pot and then like, you know, I like, I wasn't sober, sober. Right. Because, you know, I stopped participating in, in like those fellowships and then I started smoking weed and then I'd be like, just little things. Like if I had a cough, like I'd like go to like five doctors until they gave me like cough syrup with codeine. And I thought that that was totally, <laughs> I thought that, that right. was totally okay. Like, I'm like, I have a cough. Yeah. Like I need it. I need it. You know, this is the only thing that's going to help. And I do get really bad bronchitis, but you know, I would then drink like half the bottle, you know? So things were not, you know, I never thought I would drink again, but like, mm-hmm. if you stop being honest with yourself and you continue to try to get co- cough syrup or coney and, and like, you know, you're not right. doing things in a sober way, you will end up back where you were. And like, that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. What during that time did the, did you experience uh, the, those 10 years um, in between? Would you say that was the, the mental health, aspect um flaring up or was it in remission or it was so bad like it was like i didn't even know what was happening to me like that was that's another part of the whole story like you know i i was like misdiagnosed and then like on wrong medications and then like no medication and then you know, it was a nightmare, actually. It was really nightmare. Just, unfortunately, there's a lot of doctors that don't know what they're talking about. And, right. and yeah, there, there just are. And people, you know, there's such a stigma around being an addict, too. Mm-hmm. We're just looked down upon. Like, we really are, sadly, you know. Absolutely. I, could, there's, I couldn't agree with you more about that and the importance of finding a good prescribe or a good prescribing physician um, that is educated enough in addiction to where they know they have the appropriate bedside manner of dealing with uh, addiction in a um, respectful way uh, with integrity. And that's not something that's taught in medical school. It's not something that's taught. I mean, it's, you know, and so um, that's where I think referrals are great for, you know, for people to find the right the right person. I, you know, one of the biggest themes in your story that I wanted to have you expound on is your experience being medicated. So many people, I think, struggle in addiction. So, so many of us get sober, right? Like you were talking about, like who knew what was going on with my brain naturally because I was doing so many substances, but you take substances away and then you have a baseline to be able to say, what's up, what's down. And so once you start getting medicated, what, what, what was that experience like for you? And can you take us through that? Just kind of the bullet point of that (laughs) progress. I don't like, that's like a whole, it's like the short version is like, it took, well, it took like, maybe three years to finally like have a doctor be like, I think you're bipolar two. I think, I think you have bipolar two disorder, you know, which was like, Whoa, like that made so much sense. Mm -hmm. Like they're like, you know, it was on my 30th birthday, which is like annoying as hell. But, um, but you know, just because you're bipolar two doesn't mean they're just going to give you medication and make it all better. Like I I was put on medication at that point that did not work for me. And made me so depressed and so tired and so like not me. And he just kept giving me more of it and more of it and more of it. And like thinking it was going to make me better and it didn't. And, you know, I think that I honestly have struggled. Like maybe there were, it took years for me to get like on the right medication, sadly. Like, Mm -hmm. and And then it stopped working, the medication, this past year. And I had to go on new medication, which was such a fucking... It was really scary, actually. Because my baseline is not good. (laughs) Right. My my baseline is normal. (laughs) I'm sure from the very beginning, when you went to treatment at Karen, as as addicts um, or people who struggle with substance use disorder, we get taught hopefully in you know a reputable treatment center we're taught like 
most of us don't know how to ask for help and use our voice correctly. And so they were taught how to do that. But one thing that we're not taught how to do is to advocate for ourselves medically when it comes to medication with our providers in identifying exactly what our symptoms are, if they're getting better, if they're getting worse, using the, you know, the, the, the wording to alert them of, of what that is. And so, you know, you, I've heard you talk about before that, that took on, I mean, you talk about the years that that took you. Was there a point or someone or something that an experience that taught you, whoa, Leah, you've got to advocate for yourself because they're not going to figure this out for you on your own. My mother, my mom was like, like, I remember being in her house and like, this is when I was on that medication that like wasn't working for me. And I was just like in bed, like mm-hmm. I couldn't move and I was like crying. And she was like, give me the bottle. And she like threw it in the garbage. She was like, you're done. Like, you're not taking that shit anymore, you know? And she's like, and then I found a new doctor, you know, I stopped seeing that doctor. He apologized to me. He's like, I really thought that it was just because you weren't on enough. It, it's like, and actually that doctor told me, look, psychiatry is the wild, wild west. We don't know. We just give you things and we see if it works. That's what it is. It's really crazy. I recently had that gene site thing done. Yeah. You know, for those of the, for those who don't know, could you share just like a yeah. little bit about what that is? Gene site is a company that um, takes your DNA and, or your blood. I can't remember if they use your blood or, mm-hmm. or saliva. I don't remember what I did, but they, I, I don't, I don't know exactly how, but it's like, it's based off of like specific genetic markers of what mm-hmm. psychotropic drugs psychotropic drugs will work best for you and what won't. And there's different categories. There's one where it's like, you're going to need a lot of this for it to work. Or like this one is not going to work because like, it's, you know, it's just not going to or whatever. There's different. And then this one might work, but it might not, you know, there's different levels of stuff. So it was interesting to get that done. But I mean, like just in January, I had to go through a whole new cycle of finding new medication, you know, which was a nightmare. I mean, Mm -hmm. it sucks. It really sucks. Like there's just, you know, it's kind of like when you have like a health issue, like having diabetes probably sucks and having like whatever, having like a medical condition sucks. Like having a mental health condition sucks and it takes going to doctors and it takes sometimes going to a hospital and it takes, you know, it's like, it's a health condition. I mean, that's really what it is. That's what it is. Have you struggled with the acceptance piece, like coming revolutionizing back around and, you know, you, you accept it. This is what it is. This is my life. And then it comes back and, you know, you start fighting again with this being something that is. Yeah, no, this morning I was like in it because I started <laughs> feeling like seasonal depression. Like I can start feeling like the chemicals changing in my brain, like right now, because yeah. of like, it's getting darker. It's cold out. Yep. Why am I feeling depressed? Why am I so tired? I, why can't I get to the gym? I'm like, oh shit, I better get to the gym because this is seasonal depression yeah. hitting me. And then I was thinking this morning, I started feeling sorry for myself. I was like, why the fuck? Why do I have to fucking deal with this shit? You know what I mean? But this is this is what it is. You know, like it. You know, it is what it is. I'm I'm just grateful that I have like resources. I have health insurance. Like you know, I'm very lucky. Like there's a lot of people that aren't so lucky. You know, so. But yeah, I definitely yes. go through things where I'm like, well, maybe I don't need to be on medication or maybe I don't have this or maybe it's the doctors are lying to me. You know, I'm, I'm always in a place of like fighting it. And, and then sometimes I'm like totally accepting like I'll just be on medication forever and that's okay. And sometimes it's not okay. <laughs> right, right. So I, thank you for your honesty about that because I think there are so many of us that, that do that medicate when medication is required, whether you're in recovery or not, it's, it's, it's a battle. It's, you know, you feel like the, you know, if I, if I have to do this process of being sober, why can't I control my thoughts? If I can, you know, if I'm right. Yeah. And also like, you know what, I've kind of been like, not struggling with, but I've been like, kind of being like, well, 
why am I talking about this publicly sometimes, right? I'm opening myself up. Not that I love doing this, but like, you know, just yeah. like on the show and stuff. Like, why do I have to like, you know, uh -huh. like bipolar stuff was brought up. Like, what if I didn't want to talk about it at the time? I just did Ultimate Girls Trip. I had to deal with people kind of not attacking, but like putting my sobriety, like kind of putting it down kind of. And I'm like, why am I dealing really? with it? Yeah, yeah. A lot of people just don't, they don't get it. Like they don't understand, you know? And again, it's, it's, a, it's something that people judge. It's some, pe some people don't understand it. Some people don't care. I mean, you know, it's messed up. When you've encountered that, especially on camera or, you know, it, like what you were just referencing, do you find that it, it's, it, it's a situation where you can utilize it as an educational experience for these people in your life or it, there's just a wall there and you just have to take it for what it is. And like, mainly it's just annoying. Kind of and mainly it's annoying because it's not my job to like educate people that like should already know. Like it's 2022. We just went through a national, right. we went through a global pandemic. There's yep. more people, there's more people overdosing and killing themselves now than ever. It's not my job to teach people that we're in a mental living through a crisis of addiction and mental health issues, uh, specifically yep. brought on by the pandemic. So it's not, it's just not my job. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, I think that said in a different way, like your, our actions, you know, the whole, the whole saying about like actions speak louder than words. I think that your life and being so open regardless is something uh, that when we choose to be just so radically open, it's like people can choose to let that be inform them or yeah. not. And, you know, so speaking of controversy and growth and, you know, in your journey, I, I, I want to touch on a little bit spirituality. You were raised Catholic and you've been very open about that, that transition to Judaism over the past couple of years. Could you just share a little bit about that? What sparked that and, and where you are with it today? Absolutely. You know, I think that, I always was, I'm, I'm on a spiritual journey. Like I'm on a path of self-discovery, like all of that, you know, like, and it's been ongoing. I mean, it's been, it's changed so much throughout the years. I mean, like, and, and being sober definitely, you know, obviously like helped, you know, and kind of like ushered it in to make it happen. And like, I was even going to like a Hare Krishna temple for a couple of years. So like, it's not that yeah. like, you know, it's not that surprising that I ended up converting to Judaism also just because I've been, I've been really curious about the religion for so many years, like ever since I was actually a teenager and like one of my best friends was Jewish and I was like, oh, this tradition kind of makes sense. And I kind of like that and tell me more about this, you know, and then I had like a rabbi, I was when I was working in the garment district, my ex business partners were Jewish and they always had rabbis up there and they were always doing, I mean, for every single holiday, as you know, there's a lot of Jewish holidays. Maybe you don't know, but there's so many. And so yeah. the rabbis were always up at the office and I was always asking them questions. And it's kind of like, because we're dealing with anti-Semitism being at the forefront of the conversation right now, thanks to Kanye West. Uh, I wrote an article in, 2018 about anti-semitism within the women's march like organization and like that mm -hmm. like, like i wrote it for a um a jewish publication and not like that was the turning point but like again it just brought me closer to that community and that religion and once the pandemic hit i kind of thought like yolo like what am i waiting for let me take the classes and once i get to the point of conversion i'm gonna see if i feel like i'm ready to do it or not you know and that's kind of yeah. how it Beautiful. So are you uh, through the full conversion process I now? Am. or I'm fully converted in March. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And it's just been such a great, like, it's just a great addition to my life. It's just like, it's enriched my life so much, you know? And yeah, I'm happy. I'm Jewish. It's great. <laughs> I love that. I love that so much. So 
one of my last questions for you is, uh, you know, and <laughs> this is this is uh, a little bit more of a superficial thing, but you know, we. Uh, you talk about this a little tongue in cheek and just being fun and honest with a plastic surgery, right? Mm-hmm. So one of the tenets of mental health recovery, you know, we, we embrace all the things of ourselves. And I kind of love how you've talked about just owning and being upfront with people about like, when I got to a place, I chose to do it. And I wanted to do it. But what, what was the, you know, how, how did you approach that decision? Wait, sorry, what? <laughs> how did you approach that decision of like, you know, not letting the, you know, making sure that your insides weren't dictating yeah. what you did from the outside? Right. I think that, well, I think there was actually a point where maybe I was more focused on the outsides than the insides. and like. I had to, you know, kind of get my ass back to therapy and like recommit myself to sobriety and like new Mm -hmm. last year. But listen, like people should just do what they feel like, you know, like, and why not? I mean, I think that obviously there's like, there's, there's the Kardashians. I mean, there's like, and also just be like, just to be honest, like we all know, like, it's just crazy. We keep denying it. Like, tell us who your surgeons are. We just want to know, share. (laughs) But there is, there is this, like, there is a, you know, there's a line that you have to be careful of, you know, wanting to are you doing it? Is it the God size hole that you're trying to fill with plastic surgery? Because it's not going to work. Right. That's never, that's not making that better. Am I going to look a little better in photos now that I had my nose done? Yes. But that's all it's doing. It's not doing anything else. It's not fulfilling me. It's not making me feel good about who I am. It's just making me look a little better in photos. That's it. Absolutely. Well, and so one of the reasons why I wanted to ask you about that specifically is because we find we find ourselves in recovery doing that, using all kinds of things to cope, right. To fill, to fill that God sized hole. And um, so this is just such a great example of one that can be so controversial that people love to argue over whether or not it's worth it, whether it's right, whether it's wrong. And I just appreciate your, your candid, candidness and, and just, you know, being open about that part. Absolutely. So what is, uh, what is driving your recovery today? What would you say is what, like your primary driver? Um, probably like my daughter. I mean, I, I know that like, but like, you know, just that's like my primary driver for everything. Yeah. But also like my, my, just my overall, like, look, I'm, it's not some like, I mean, I'm the kind of person I don't wake up and I'm like, yay, life is happening. Like, that's just not my baseline. You know what I mean? It's just, I'm kind of like having an existential crisis, like every morning, like, here I go. What am I doing? Uh," You know? So I need to stay sober. Like I need to, like, if I don't stay sober, if I don't stay in recovery and I'm not just going to stay sober because like, there's a difference between being like dry and like, you know, being in recovery and working on yourself. And that's right. That's the difference between like, I think what I'm doing now versus what I was doing before is I'm much yeah. more committed in a way and being honest with myself in a way that I wasn't, which I'll have to write about for book number two. But, you know, it, it's like just for my own, for my, for my sanity, for my well being, yeah. you know? Absolutely. So what would you say to the person that's watching, listening right now as kind of a closing thought for them, you know, that's identified with a part or many parts of your story, uh, what, what piece of encouragement would you like to leave them with today? I think that like, we're not alone going through this stuff. Like, that's the other thing. Like, you know, it can be really isolating to have mental deal with mental health stuff dealing with substance use disorder which i love this this um phrase for it or the name for it but um 
you know, it's like, you're not alone. There's someone else. There's so many people that are dealing with it. And like, I don't know, that gives me comfort knowing that, you know, and I think that's why I do talk about it publicly, even though it's not always comfortable to talk about it publicly at all. Yeah. But, but like, I have to, like, I, I have to, you know, like I'm a public person. I'm, I'm a public mm-hmm. figure. It's like, I would be, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night if I was like pretending that I didn't have these obstacles in my life or these issues, you know, because like that would just be shitty to do, like to pretend like everything's all good all the time. Like, and that I don't have, no, I can't do that. So I would just say words of encouragement is like, you're not alone and advocate Mm. for yourself with these psychiatrists. You have to. 100%. (laughs) And I have to follow that with saying thank you for being, uh, listening to that internal voice that that said, you know, despite the circumstances around you and how people react and how, regardless of how you're going to be received, that you put the next foot forward, wake up in the middle, you know, of a chaotic brain and say, I'm I'm still going to do this today, if not for myself, for the people around me and for the lives that I might change. Because it's true. Thank you, Patrick. You'll never know. This was great. Yeah. It was really great. Absolutely. So l- last question, what's next on the horizon for you? I know you talked about the um, Ultimate Girls trip. Anything else that yeah. you, you know want to share? Yes, there's a lot of things going on, but I don't really like talking about them until they're like, okay. <laughs> until they're like you know, announced and out there and things like that. So <laughs> for now, it's just I'm just going to say Ultimate Girls trip. That's what I'll plug. Cool. Do we, do you have an, do they have an air date for when that's coming out yet? No, just 2023. Okay. Well, we'll be, we'll be looking out for it. And uh, thank you so much again, Leah McSweeney. I want to remind everybody uh, that it is never too late to start loving yourself and you are only one decision away from a completely different life. And with that, we are out. For more information on today's episode, check out the show notes. Recovery Stories is brought to you by Promises Behavioral Health's Rooted Alumni Community. If you or a loved one are struggling, have questions, or ready to take the next step, call our admission center at 888-648-4098. Or visit us online at www.promisesbehavioralhealth.com. Our team is ready and waiting to answer the call for help. Whether you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please share with your friends. Follow, subscribe, and leave us a review. We are grateful for you and hope that you have been encouraged by today's episode. As always, remember you are only one decision away from a completely different life, and it is never too late to start loving yourself.